We're going to talk about bipolar and related disorders. This is chapter 13 in your textbook. Bipolar disorders are mood disorders with recurrent episodes of depression and mania. When moods cloud reasoning and judgment, they become problematic and interfere with interpersonal relationships. Bipolar disorder frequently goes unrecognized and people suffer for years before receiving a proper diagnosis and treatment. So let's get started here. When we think about behaviors in bipolar, um, we can talk about mania, hypomania, and rapid cycling. Mania are abnormal elevated moods. They usually require hospitalization, and sometimes these episodes can last at least a week. Hypomania is less severe, it lasts less time, and sometimes hospitalization isn't even required. It's just, they are just less impaired with hypomania. Rapid cycling is four or more episodes of hypomania or acute mania within one year associated with increased recurrence rate and resistance to treatment. So those are just your definitions that I want you to be aware of. So when we think about the clinical picture, most of us spend time in moderate moods, meaning we aren't really ever super high or we aren't really low or just somewhere in the middle there. Mania is one of the primary symptoms of bipolar. Patients with bipolar that are manic are the happiest, most excited, most optimistic people you will ever meet. They are euphoric and energized. Sleep is decreased and energy is increased. Depression, on the other hand, can happen relatively quickly. Bipolar is characterized by periods of mania or hypomania that alternates with depression. And these disorders are classified as bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and, cyclo and cyclo cyclothymic disorder. Sorry about that. So when we think about bipolar 1 disorder, um, the patient has at least one episode of mania alternating with major depression. This mania can last for about a week, lots of excessive activity, energy, and it's alternating with depression. Mania symptoms are so severe with our bipolar 1 that it becomes a psychiatric emergency. Patients may be a danger to themselves others, or their finances. Bipolar 2 has less mania. It's not as extreme, but they have very profound depression. People will usually have one type or the other, not mixed. And then cyclothymic, why am I struggling with that disorder, um, is similar to bipolar type 2. We usually see hypomania with mild to moderate depression, and it can last for about two years in adults. That rapid cycling can occur where we have those four mood episodes and a 12 month period of time, and it could occur over a week or even a 24 hour period of time. So if you will look at the um, picture there on your slide, you can see bipolar one has those really, really high highs and those really, really low lows, where um, bipolar um, two, you can have those highs, but they're not as high, so hypomania, but you spend a lot of time more profoundly depressed. So when we think about hypomania, just another slide talking about it, this is that low level, less dramatic mania. They do still tend to be euphoric and often increases functioning. It's usually accompanied by excessive activity and energy, and you usually see it in bipolar two. So you can see um, on this continuum, bipolar one has that hypermania with very major depression. It's that pink um, half circle there, right? We go from one extreme all the way to the other. Bipolar 2 has mania, but not as extreme, so that hypomania, but with very profound still depression. And 
cyclothymia is that hypomania with minor depression episodes alternating for about two years in length. Other bipolar disorders that we can talk about are substance medication induced bipolar and then bipolar and related disorders due to just another medical condition. And I'm not going to get really into those. Just know that there are some others out there um, that we could talk about. As far as epidemiology, the lifetime risk uh, for overall is about 4%. Men and women have nearly equal rates of bipolar disorders, yet they respond somewhat differently to that condition. Men with bipolar disorders are more likely to have legal problems, commit acts of violence, where women with bipolar are more likely to misuse alcohol, commit suicide, and sometimes even develop thyroid disease. As far as children and adolescents, um, you'll see that we talk about disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, there was a big uptick in our bipolar um, diagnoses with children and adolescents, and then they're kind of labeled and they have trouble with insurances later in life and things like that. So we've tried to come up with a different um, diagnosis per se with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder um, so they're not labeled with that bipolar. And then a uh, cyclothymic disorder um, can happen as, as early as adolescence, early adulthood. Um, most of the time, if they have that, they have about a 50% risk of subsequent bi bipolar one or two. So some risk factors that we can um, think about are biological factors, um, genetic, neurobiological, neurobiolo neuroendocrine, or peripheral inflammation. So when we're thinking about genetic, there is some evidence suggesting that bipolar disorders are more prevalent in adults who have very high intelligence quotients or IQs, um, particularly verbally um, as children. Neurobiological um, neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin um, were the early focus. Uh, too few of those neurotransmitters resulted in depression, and an overabundance resulted in mania. However, proportions of neurotransmitters in relation to one another may be just as important, as well as that receptor site insensitivity. As far as in neuroendocrine, hypothyroidism is one of the most common physical abnormalities, and then peripheral inflammation is increased. Environmental factors linked to our childhood trauma or stress, and then cognitive factors with the advent of improved neuroimaging techniques and treatment advances, psychological theories are largely dismissed. So let's get into our nursing process. So we know that with the nursing process, we're gonna perform an assessment first, and it's gonna be a patient that has a diagnosis of bipolar and there are five main focuses with the assessment piece. Uh, the first one is mood. When the patient is in that manic state, they can be very euphoric, they have an overwhelming sense of self, and they have a very self-inflated point of view. They may laugh, they may joke, um, they continuously talk, 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 talk. They create these elaborate schemes to get rich and famous. These patients can become very convincing very confident in what they are talking about. They are very busy during the day, constantly moving, not eating, not sleeping, and this is where patients can get into financial troubles, excessive spending, use of credit cards, giving away money, and their prized possessions. So we need to be very conscientious of that mood and where are they at. As far as behavior, again, they have this nonstop physical activity, they are not stopping to eat, they are not stopping to sleep, and they can just become physically exhausted. If they do not get treated, this could end up in death for them. So we really have to watch them very closely. Um, their dress may be very outlandish, bizarre, colorful, inappropriate. If they're wearing makeup, it may be very gaudy. And they also have a very much a lack of concentration. They're unable to follow what you're talking about with them. Um, this is also where risky behaviors can happen, increase in sexual partners, 
that might lead to several diseases and can also cause a large impact on marriages and our divorce rates. When we talk about thought processes and speech pad patterns, mania causes a person to experience disorganized thoughts and speech patterns. Two of these here. So when we're assessing our speech pattern, the first one that we can think about is pressured speech. This is fast, it's frantic, it's conveying urgency. They are usually very loud and incoherent. Non-stop talking about um, without any interest in any conversation. Circumstantial speech is adding unnecessary details when communicating. Patients will eventually get to the point. So let me read the story. I plan to have my oil changed today. When I got in my car, I noticed that the leather on the seat was dirty. The dog. We got a brown and white beagle because uh, Jim insisted upon it. He's a barker. That's how things have gone since we got married in 1986 at a lovely church. I'll never forget the minister wore a green suit and dirty shoes. After I cleaned the seat, I drove to the garage and four guys swarmed around the car and changed the oil. So we got to the point, but we have lots of unnecessary details within that communicating. He started with the oil being changed. He ended with the oil being changed. But the, so the patient gets to the point, but there's lots of unnecessary details in the middle. And that's circumstantial speech. When we talk about tangential speech, it's similar to circumstantial, except they never really get to the point. I did the laundry that day because it was Saturday. On Saturday, I always watch Ninja Turtles on television. Have you seen those 60 inch televisions? Giants. I used to think of giants as I fell asleep, but I thought that sleep activated them, right? We never got to any point into that story. That's tangential. When we think about loose associations, these are thoughts that are very loosely connected. The sky is the limit. Now that I have money, I took a flight, you know, from Kennedy. Drinking beer is a belly full of bags. So they sort of kind of are connected, but very loosely. Flight of ideas is a continuous flow of accelerated speech. They continue to talk and talk and talk, topic to topic to topic. Constant ideas are coming out. How are you doing, kid? No kidding around. I'm going home, home sweet home. Home is where the heart is. The heart of the matter is what is I want out. And that ain't hey. Hey, doc, get me out of this place. Right, they're just going and going, topic to topic, talking, talking. That is our flight of ideas. And the last one is clang associations, where they string together words because they rhyme. Cinema one and two, last row. Row, row, row your boat. Don't be a cutthroat. Cut your throat, get your goat, go out and vote. And so I wrote. So clang associations are those rhyming words. So then we think about thought content. It's um, often sexually explicit, and it can range from inappropriate to very vulgar. Mania also brings about disturbing ways of viewing others and the world, and we do call those delusions. So when we think about thought content, um, grandiose delusions and persecutory delusions. Those grandiose delusions are that inflated view of self. They may exaggerate their achievements or how important they are. Lots of I statements with those. Persecutory delusions, they're being persecuted for some reason. God is punishing them. The FBI is spying on them. So both of those are delusions with the thought content. Um, sensory perceptions may become altered as the mania, mania escalates and hallucinations, hallucinations could occur at that point. And then the last um, assessment piece is our cognitive function. So cognitive dysfunction, um, clinical um, aspects of that is it's just going to really affect our overall function. As far as cognitive deficits, it's going to correlate with manic episodes, history of psychosis, chronicity of illness, and poor functional outcome. Early diagnosis and treatment are crucial to prevent illness progression, cognitive deficits, and poor outcomes. Medication selection should 
um, consider not only the efficacy of the drug and reducing those mood symptoms, but also the cognitive impact of the drug on the patient. Early diagnosis and proper treatment can also help people avoid suicide attempts, alcohol or substance use of problems, marital or work problems, and development of medical comorbidities. So I think this is a really great picture of the symptoms of a patient with mania. You can see that the dress is very outlandish, colorful, right? She's wearing a scarf, she's wearing shorts, she's digging in the dirt with her high heels on. Um, you can see what she's kind of saying. She's using some alternative speech pattern. And if you think about the just acronym DIG FAST, um, those are primary symptoms of our manic. So distractibility, indiscretion, grandiose, flight of ideas, activity increase, sleep deficit, and talkativeness. As far as self-assessment, um, nurses may feel very discomforted. That's very common, especially if our patient is experiencing mania. Um, you could find yourself feeling maybe afraid, inadequate, or even angry. So enhance your professional ability by uh, sharing or acknowledging uncomfortable feelings with staff or nursing faculty, collaborating with staff and nursing faculty, and then sharing those experiences in some type of a post-conference. Um, that'll kind of help with that uncomfortable feeling you may have. So let's um, think about assessment guidelines for our bipolar disorder. We wanna assess whether the patient is a danger to themselves or others. Patients, again, may not eat or sleep for days at a time. They have, may have poor impulse control, which could result in harm to themselves or others. We wanna assess the need for protection from inhibited behaviors. External control may be needed to protect from consequences of giving everything away, whether that's their possessions, their money, that could lead to bankruptcy. We're gonna assess the need for hospitalization, assess their medical status. Um, a thorough examination will need to be performed to see if mania is primary, secondary to a medical condition, or substance-induced. Are there any coexisting medical conditions? And then we do wanna assess the patient's and the family's understanding of bipolar, the knowledge of the medications, the knowledge of support groups and organizations that provide help. So we've done our thorough assessment. Um, now we need to prioritize our problems. Um, we always worry about safety first, risk of injury, risk of violence, whether that be self-directed or towards other, and then that ineffective coping. Outcomes will be based on um, one of the three phases of illness that the patient is experiencing. The three phases are acute, continuation, and maintenance. In the acute phase, um, we want to prevent injury, uh, maintain stable cardiac status, maintain hydration, tissue integrity, um, get sufficient sleep and rest, demonstrate thought self-control, and attempt no self-harm. They are in the acute phase, and our biggest thing is preventing injury or harm to themselves or others. When we talk about the maintenance phase, during this stage, the most acute symptoms are now under control. The longer term maintenance phase begins after the resolution of acute episodes. The goal is now on preventing future exacerbations of the mania or hypomania. As we plan patients in the acute phase, we focus on medical stabilization. That's our priority to prevent physical exhaustion. We're gonna maintain their safety if they are harm to themselves or others. We're gonna look at in-hospital nursing care, and we're gonna make sure we're meeting the bottom of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Those physiological needs need to be met before we can move up that hierarchy. And then the last one is seclusion restraints or ECT could be considered during that acute phase, um, but we should use those as last resort. During the maintenance phase, planning focuses on preventing prevention of relapse and limiting severity and duration of future episodes. Patients with bipolar disorder require medications over long periods of time 
um, sometimes over their entire lifetime. During this time, people with bipolar often face interpersonal, familial, occupational, educational, and financial hardships that came out of that acute phase. So patients will need support in repairing their lives from the hardships that came out of the acute phase of that illness. So let's think about implementation, um, whether it's a depressive episode or manic episodes, they're going to look a little bit different. So depressive episodes are usually similar to symptoms to major depression disorder, but usually much more intense. Hospitalization for suicidal, psychotic or catatonic signs if they're present. Medication concerns about bringing on a manic phase if that was how it was impacted. As far as manic episodes, hospitalization for acute mania, which is usually our bipolar one disorders to help provide safety. And there are communicating challenges and strategies that will need to be implemented if the patient is in the acute phase. This slide just talks about some of the communication techniques. Staff members continuously set limits in a very firm, non-threatening and neutral manner to prevent further escalation of mania and provide safe boundaries for the patients and others. Use firm and calm approach. Um, this just provides structure and control. We're gonna use short, concise explanations. Patients will have very short attention span, which will limit comprehension to just small bits of information. It's also gonna help minimize potential for those manipulative behaviors that they may display. We're going to identify expectations in simple, concrete terms. Clear expectations help the patient experience outside controls, as well as understand reasons for their medications, maybe for seclusion or their restraints that we may have to use for them. Um, hear and act on legitimate complaints. Underlying feelings of helplessness are reduced and acting out behaviors are minimized. Um, if we're hearing them and acting on those complaints. And then the last one there is firmly redirect energy into more appropriate channels. Distractibility is the most effective tool for a patient experiencing mania. During the maintenance phase of mania, interventions are geared to preventing, pre preventing relapse. Medication adherence is essential regular and adequate sleep, healthy nutrition, community support, um, and then individuals will likely be engaging with community resources and the use of those outpatient facilities. So when we talk about health teaching and promotion, patients with bipolar disorder, as well as their friends and families can benefit from support groups such as those sponsored by the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, and the National Mental Health Associations and the Manic Depressive. So just talking to um, patients about what their resources are. Interprofessional staff work together to create a climate of teamwork and safety. Uh, frequent staff meetings to deal with patient behavior and staff response will um, with especially with challenging patient behaviors and then we need to make sure we're really setting our limits and being consistent with that that's going to help minimize staff splitting and reduce feelings of anger fear and isolation um, staff splitting is when the patient actually um, splits the staff right they um, say you walk in and oh, that's not what so-and-so said. And so then that kind of puts that nurse on edge. And so they're, they're attempting to split the staff. So if we can set limits and be consistent with them, that'll minimize some of that. Uh, limit setting is the main theme in treating a person in a manic state. If we say lights are out at 11 p.m., then lights are out at 11 p.m. As far as seclusion and restraints, um, they may be warranted. Um, if documentation data is showing substantial risk of harm to others or self, um, the patient is unable to control their actions uh, or other measures have failed. Protocols must identify specific nursing responsibilities 
And then we need to make sure communication for those in seclusion is concrete, direct, and empathetic. Reassure that patient it is only temporary and that they will be returned to the unit when they demonstrate the ability to safely be around others. Restraints and seclusion are never used for punishment or convenience for the staff. And then we're gonna evaluate. Evaluation um, outcome criteria. We're gonna reassess those outcomes in the care plan and revise if needed. So what are some treatment modalities when we're thinking about our bipolar patients and um, our bipolar disorder? So the first one is biological or pharmacotherapy. Um, there's two main foci, and that's agitation and mood stabilization. Lithium is the most widely used mood stabilizer. It is the first choice of therapy, um, typically given for the mania, but can control the depression also. It does take about 7 to 14 days to become effective. In the meantime, we may need to give benzos um, to help bring them down from the mania symptoms and also to prevent physical exhaustion. As that lithium becomes more effective, then we can taper off the antipsychotics or benzos that we've started them on. Remember, lithium is not a cure. It just helps manage the symptoms. Uh, lithium is indicated for elation, grandiosity, flight of ideas, irritability, manipulation, anxiety, and self-injurious behaviors. It can also help control insomnia, psychomotor agitation, distractibility, hypersexuality, and paranoia. The biggest issue with lithium, it, is, it has a very narrow therapeutic window. So we want to have the lowest blood level that we can have without signs and symptoms of toxicity. So when we look at, um, this just came from your book, The Signs of Toxicity, um, expected side effects are going to include a slight tremor, polyuria, nausea, vomiting, lethargy. Those aren't really super concerning. Early signs of toxicity that might be a little more concerning might include confusion, GI upset, slurred speech, muscle weakness. Um, that's usually when their blood level is going to be between 1.0 all the way up to 1.5. At that point, we're going to hold that medication. We're going to continue to measure their lithium levels, and then we're going to dose as the physician has um, reevaluated. Any advanced or severe signs of toxicity, we're holding that med. If the, severe, if the toxicity is severe enough, we may need to get it out of their system. Lithium levels have to be drawn very frequently. Um, initially, it's every about five days, and then after every dose change. Once we meet our therapeutic level, our le levels, uh, labs are usually drawn monthly. Once the patient has six months of stability, then they may be drawn every three months. Two long-term risks of lithium therapy is hypothyroidism and kidney function. They can really lose the ability to concentrate urine. Some of the contraindications include renal function and thyroid function. So this is just, again, a slide that just has more information on lithium toxicity. And this one is lots of patient and family teaching. So I thought this had just a lot of great information um, that could be utilized for your medication sheet. Other treatments that can be used in our patients um, if they're not a candidate for lithium, um, and this is going to um, include our anticonvulsant therapies. So um, Depakote or, or Valporate are lithium non-responders. Um, we want to definitely monitor liver function and platelet count. Common side effects could include nausea, weakness, um, indigestion, dizziness, and some vomiting. Uh, Tegretol or carbamazepine carb um, can work effectively on patients with mania that are paranoid angry versus the mania that are euphoric and over-friendly. So depending on their mania, Tegretol might be a really good um, secondary medication if lithium is not um, tolerated. Liver enzymes should be monitored. CBC will be drawn initially. 
and then periodically to check for any leukopenia and apoptotic anemia. When we're talking about lamectal, that's actually the first line for bipolar for patients greater than 18. Um, the serious skin disorder that can occur in about 10% of the population taking lamectal is Steven Johnson syndrome, and that's a dermatological reaction that could be life-threatening. So that would be a really great teaching. Um, if your patient's taking lamectal, you need to be watching for that Steven Johnson syndrome, which is just a, um, a skin disorder. Second generation antipsychotics are approved for acute mania. These drugs do have some serious side effects that lean toward weight gain, um, which increases your insulin resistance, would lead, which leads to diabetes and then cardiovascular impairment. Um, so you can see some of those examples there. Um, brain stimulation therapies, ECT. One major uh, advantage of ECT is that it works more quickly than medication and improving those depressive symptoms. Um, usually you can see a lot of improvement within a week of starting ECT. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, research has been conducted that provides support in patients with bipolar. In fact, it has been found to improve cognitive function in patients with bipolar. So it may just be a matter of time before this is used for approval. As far as psychological therapies, we can think about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is usually an adjunct to pharmacotherapy. Um, CBT focuses on adherence to the medication regimen, early detection and intervention for mania or depressive episodes, stress and lifestyle management, and the treatment of depression and comorbid conditions. Interpersonal and social rhythm therapy aims to regulate social routines and stabilize interpersonal relationships. And then family-focused therapy just helps that communication among family members. Again, this is a, kind of a great picture of our bipolar patient. Um, you can see mania on the left, depression on the right. Um, and this picture is actually posted for you in Moodle, but it's going to go over what you would see with each of those um, highs or lows. And that concludes chapter 13 on bipolar and bipolar related disorders. If you have any questions, you can um, send me an email or we'll chat about it in class. Thanks guys.